This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week, OnePlus got caught throttling some of their phones, Opal got ready to release their first ever chip, and Xiaomi's flagship smartphones finally gained some ground. As every week, we also have 20 brand new questions in our tech knowledge quiz. This week's is one of my favorites in a long time, so check it out. Links are in the description and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with the Urbanista Lisbon and Seoul, and sure, they look fun, but my main reason for picking them is just to highlight how much better Urbanista's naming scheme of just picking a cool city is than that of almost any other earbuds maker, including my second release highlight of the week, the LG Tone Free DFP8W. Seriously, why do companies hate good names? Anyway, like its predecessor, this pair has a UV light built into the case itself to kill off germs, which is cool, I guess, and it comes with active noise cancelling and APTX for 180 euros. Not bad. And the most upvoted product this week in the crowd up was the OLED version of the Nintendo Switch, which is just a Switch with a new kickstand and Ethernet port and, you know, an OLED screen. Not quite the big update that many were hoping for. To stay up to date with all of the new releases, check out our full release monitor in the crowd app where we add new products daily and upload your favorite products so that they rise to the top. Okay, my first story of the week will be Anantech publishing a great analysis of OnePlus, significantly throttling the performance of many popular apps, such as Chrome, Twitter, and Uber on the OnePlus 9 and 9 Pro. I recommend you read the full analysis that is linked down in the description, but basically the Snapdragon 888 has three types of CPU cores, and apps that OnePlus has put on a list to be throttled can usually only access the lower powered ones, or they run at reduced clock rates on the others, leading to them performing significantly up to two to four times worse in some workloads. Other people, such as Gary Sims, have concluded that the same throttling does not appear to happen on previous generation OnePlus flagships, so we think it is likely related to the Snapdragon 888 chip, and while we don't have access to the full list yet, it seems like things like web browsers, social media apps, light games, and tools are throttled, while benchmarks, heavy games, video editing software, and any other heavy-duty apps seem to run at full performance. Also, the phone includes things like touch boosters that temporarily push performance up whenever you interact with a throttled app so it feels more responsive than it actually should be, and then they jump back down when you stop interacting with it. So it seems like a pretty complex system. Anyway, all of this has created a lot of outrage online as people really don't like it when their stuff gets throttled. But I, as a person who has said many negative things about OnePlus in the past, I actually have some mixed feelings about this. First, I don't quite know how OnePlus thought that they could just sneak this in and not tell anybody about it. It seems quite disingenuous, especially when the benchmarks don't actually reflect real-world performance at all times, so that's kind of problematic. And I really feel like there should have been at least an option to turn these optimizations off. The typical OnePlus flagship customer is exactly the type of person who would want to pick their own trade-offs between performance and battery life instead of being babied around, so hiding it was definitely a bad move. And it's also pretty problematic that the company can just decide which apps it wants to throttle without even telling anyone about it, which kind of lets them distort competition. Now, to be fair, they seem to throttle their own apps, like the Gallery or the Weather app as well, so I don't think they were up to anything nefarious, but without having a public list, we can't really rule that out. That said, I also want to point out that these phones, they've been in the wild for three, maybe three and a half months. They've been tested by hundreds of reviewers. They've been used by hundreds of thousands of users. And basically nobody complained about the performance. Some early reviewers even included these same benchmarks showing the throttling in action since the beginning, but apart from a few comments about occasional stuttering, almost every review I could find actively praised the phone's performance. And I've heard from a few reviewer friends of mine who have used the phone extensively since it has launched, and they all reported not having noticed any real performance issues. Now, that doesn't mean that the throttling isn't real, but if nobody has really complained or even really noticed in three and a half half months, then is there really a major performance problem here? If games and power-hungry apps can make full advantage of the performance, then maybe limiting your random social media apps and calculator to lower performance cores is not exactly a terrible trade-off for better battery life and less heat. 
because almost all of the reviews that I've seen have pointed out the mediocre battery life on this phone, and there are threads upon threads online pointing to overheating issues with this phone, as well as many other Snapdragon 888 phones like the Mi 11. So those clearly seem to be actual problems people have with this chip, and prioritizing those by default seems like the right thing to do for OnePlus. Again, I fully think that they should have let consumers opt out of this from the beginning and they should have published the list of apps that were affected. And I really hope that now that they've been caught red-handed, they will actually do both. But I don't think that this is part of some evil master plan to screw over the consumers like many appear to believe. Okay, my second story of the week will be a short one and it is Xiaomi celebrating that their premium phones are finally gaining significant ground, reaching 14% market share at least in India. The company for the longest time has been stuck in the status of being a budget phone maker selling really cheap phones for the most part, so it's really encouraging to see for them that their new strategy of focusing on more premium models is finally starting to work out. Now, to be clear, the data that they have shown is very cherry-picked as they smartly selected a price range that most of their competitors like OnePlus, Samsung, Oppo, and Apple don't actually sell flagships in. So it's a bit misleading, plus I'd love to see if it's a similar picture outside of India as well. But still, this is a pretty sweet jump for Xiaomi's new range of flagships and upper mid-range phones. Okay, and my last story of the week will be new reports claiming that Oppo will soon release their own image signal processor, or ISP, called the M1. ISPs, if you didn't know, are dedicated chips that do all the calculations for turning camera sensor data into an actual photo or video, such as noise reduction, compression, frame interpolation, etc. And most phone makers just use the default ISPs that are built right into the Snapdragon or MediaTek or whatever chips that their phones use. The first Android phone maker to move away from the default was Google, who built a dedicated chip called the Pixel Visual Core. Then, not long ago, Xiaomi announced their own ISP called the Surge C1, and it looks like Oppo, OnePlus, and Realme will be next in line to get their own in-house ISP as well, which is very interesting for a few reasons. First, having a dedicated in-house ISP means that the company can use the same camera hardware and software across chip vendors, but also across price ranges. If camera performance is no longer tied to the main SoC of any given device, then just like cheap Pixel phones can essentially take the same photos as the more expensive ones because of their shared image processing chips, the BB BK brands could also bring better sensors and tech to low-end phones as well if they wanted. And second, it's clear that all of the big companies are one by one trying to replace the standard Qualcomm and MediaTek solutions with their own technologies. We have seen this happen with fast charging standards before, where most Chinese players use their own proprietary solutions instead of something like Qualcomm Quick Charge. And I think we might see similar trends in other areas like ISPs as well, potentially leading to more competition and differentiation, which sounds exciting. Phone companies, of course, don't like relying on external companies and putting all of their eggs into their baskets when they can't really control that basket. And it's no different for us content creators either. And that's why we built Nebula, our very own video streaming platform to put at least some of our own eggs into. Instead of just hoping for the YouTube gods to play nice with us, we got together with some of the smartest creators that we knew, like Real Engineering, Strange Parts, City Beautiful, MKBHD, and more, and we built a beautiful platform that doesn't have ads or unnecessary tracking, and a platform that lets you, the viewer, decide what you want to watch instead of an algorithm. My tech out there videos usually even go up there a day or two early, and Nebula has lots of great originals too, like long-form documentaries from Wendover Productions, a fantastic series on the logistics of D-Day by Real Engineering and many, many more. Best of all, you can get access to Nebula for free with a subscription to my sponsor, CuriosityStream, which itself is just 15 bucks for an entire year. That's like barely more than a dollar a month. CuriosityStream is, of course, the premier place on the internet for high-quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel, and they have a huge library of science, nature, and history content to binge while you're stuck at home. I have recently finished watching an episode of Catalyst on CuriosityStream, which took a closer look at the potential of quantum computing, and there's a ton of other great content here from hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. So check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next week.